Hey YouTube, how's it going? Um, we're gonna just fire off this video uh, more or less with like a build series of stuff going on. Not much has changed, obviously you can see everything's just strewn about on the top of the countertop here, but we went inside, we made uh, this thing here in the ver ver in my first video series, I made a video on kind of how to do this. Uh, never mind all the squiggly lines, I moved things around and I didn't bother to clean any of that. I don't care about none of that, all I care about is the uh, this guy right there. So. Um, obviously what you can see I'm trying to do is find out where I'm going to place all this stuff. Uh, I'm not actually going to drill any holes in this yet, but I kind of have an idea where everything's going to go at least. So this will be where the volume pot is. It's just the center of the amp. Um, I'll have a pilot light and a whatchamacallit here, the power switch, and of course the input. Up here, this is where the uh, transformer is going to go. Um, at least I suspect that's where it's going to go. Um, I went back, double checked on the math. This guy here is going to, I think this is going to be just fine. I'm not worried about it as much as I was before. Although it does look teeny compared to some of the other ones I've seen. But I don't know, we'll see. The, the 269, the 269EX version, the one that you see with a lot of these different amps, um, is exactly the same dimensions as this. I think it's just like an itty bit, uh, itty bit, bit bigger in the in the width in this direction but so this one I don't I'm not as fearful anymore of it being able to to fit but before I actually drill any holes in this chassis I need to get this guy built so we need to populate this guy here just like so and uh, I cleaned up the leads a little bit on the uh, on the transformers there I got a mess right here like everything that I kind of need is just strewn about I threw it up here just so I can you know make this video but there's my Neutric connectors, Neutric connectors, yada, yada, yada. So I think we're good. I think those are where the uh, tubes are going to go. Obviously, this will go under inside there. And then you'll notice I don't have any marks for where the transformer is going to go. I still need to do the uh, headphone trick with the transformer. I suspect it's going to end up in there somewhere. Um, there, there, thereabouts. That's where I suspect it's going to end up. Um, this is such a low-gain amplifier. I'm not too worried about noise anyway, but... So there you go, there's our little update. All right. With nothing much more than that, obviously, and a uh, couple drill bits, um, I mean, you really only need like an eighth inch to a 516th, no, excuse me, <laughs> 516th, a uh, 564th bit to really do most all this work here with these. Obviously, once you get beyond about an eighth of an inch, you can use that as the pilot to use, you know, these unit bits and stuff like that. You can get these at Harbor Freight. They also have them at... Uh, uh, like Home Depot, Lowe's, whatnot. So you want to get yourself a couple of these guys. Um, I have one of these little motors here that you can use it to do what you need to do there with it. But uh, uh, these are great for chamfering and or just deburring. Uh, the best deburring tool ever is one of these. I talked about it in the last video. But this is really all you need right here in order to turn out... Well, let's see if I can do this without making a mess here. So let's move some things around here. So all the parts are bent up, ready to go. As you can see, get the dust off, and I'll bring over, I'll bring over the the amplifier. So you can see, I got everything drilled out. I got to figure out what jewel I want. I haven't decided on what jewel color I want. So there's no jewel in there. It's just a bulb, power switch, volume knob, input. Uh, we got the holes in the top here, so we can put the turret board in, which is underneath the mess over here. Got our, that going on. And then, of course, the stuff going on here in the back. So, again, I go with Neutric or whatever the hell you want to call it. Uh, this is going to be a bitch to get back out later. Um, obviously, there's a back sorry, there's a back panel going on here. And, oop, getting fingers in the way and stuff. Sorry, holding the camera, it's not very steady. But, uh... There's obviously going to be some panels that go on this, so all these things have to come back out and then go back in later. Um, this being the most egregious thing to fit in there because I'm not sure what the rules are in this, um, uh, you know, legally speaking or whatnot, but I like using longer screws for this particular part. All the other ones you want to get just. 
Let me see if I can get the light just for it. So you want to get them so they're just sticking out over the top, right? Objectively, that's what you want to do, is you want to have it just so it sticks out the top. It doesn't need to be much longer than that. Trying to find the exact size you need is kind of a bitch, so these ones here stick out a little bit further than I'd like, but um, just worked out that I couldn't find one that was the, exactly the right size. But I like having these ones stick out a little bit further because if by any chance it ever does come loose, you've got a lot of play time before that thing is going to um, undo itself, if it even ever comes unthreaded. But I want it to be one of those things where if, because I know people neglect things, they shouldn't, but you know, you get people with loose input jacks and loose power jacks and stuff like that. If this thing were to ever get pulled all the way out, which I'm trying not to, I want it to be so bad before it will actually come apart that you have no choice but to fix it and I, f I think and feel that the only way to do that is to leave those a little bit extra long um, some people might disagree I don't know I don't know what the legalities are on it it just seems that on occasion uh, I will see at least those on some devices where they're a little bit longer than they need to be and I think that's the reason why is that they, they just want to make sure that this thing has that much more time before it gets yanked out of the box and you know all the kibbles and bits start coming with it and all the angry pixies start trying to get out so in either case uh that's just a little update for what's going on right now and uh stay tuned for more just a little what's going on here just a little pause as we kind of show why things are being done the way they are I was under the impression that this would end up over here and facing in the opposite direction of the output transformer now this is why you don't just assume where these things are gonna go I haven't actually built this amp before I you know had an existing amplifier and that I was doing all the work on it was fine it was great they didn't have the transformers in this orientation, which is to say that if I really, really wanted to, I probably could have gone with an even smaller chassis, but it just so happened that when I was going through and doing the headphone, uh, you know, trick on this to see where I needed to put this, this was the quietest position. So interestingly enough, they're in the same orientation and they're in pretty close proximity. But you know, when I had this thing turn 90 degrees and over here, it was there was still a little bit of buzz and the only way to get rid of it was to put it like all the way on this far edge over over here but i can't put it over there because i got the input so i can't take this guy and put it over here and then when i turned it this way and kind of sat it down just trying to think about what was going on it just kind of went silent i tried doing it at 45 degrees i tried this that and the other this is the quietest position as a matter of fact it's dead silent right here so no buzz so that's why you just never know exactly where, you know, if you're prototyping an amp, you just never know quite where things are going to end up. Um, so I think I've only got one more hole I have to drill in here. i got to put a, a hole there to put another one of these guys in. And that is for the, uh, the grounding spot for all the internal stuff. Um, so you can see here, you'll have a clear view of the, the two tubes. So this will be one of the 12AX7s. That'll be the EL84. And then we'll flip this thing over. Sorry, it's a little messy up here right now as I've been working away. 
So you can kind of see here what I've done to get all these wires into place. You're going to burn a few of these uh, zip zip ties. Um, I use the little baby ones, but right now everything is kind of falling where it needs to. Um, you can see right in there, that's where that little that little thing I was talking about is going to go, this little lug. So that'll go in there. That'll be the grounding spot for the center tap, the uh, output transformer, and for the... Um, uh, the main circuit of the of the amplifier. I got this turret lug down there already for the safety ground. And then, as messy as that all looks now, by the time you get this thing sat in there, cleans it up pretty much. Like all you see is a bunch of lines coming out. Um, I obviously got to run the thing that goes around over to this tube. I still got the the lines that come off of the different tubes. You can see this guy here will end up whoop, end up going right in there. Sorry, I'm moving around a little bit. Um, another thing I have to do, I am I'm a big guy on you know making things look good and lighting and stuff. So I've got this little guy here, which is a an LED. Oops, sorry, finger in the view. It's a little LED power um, power supply. Um, I'm gonna try to wire it in off of this guy here. Um, haven't quite figured out how I'm gonna do that yet. I don't really want to try to wire it off the main power if I can get away with it, um, mainly because um, I'm already using a pair of these so I can get power in, you know, from the switch to the power transformer and then it also feeds this guy. So I'm hoping that I can just make it so it feeds this guy. But obviously you can see that I've got limited real estate down there to deal with that. Another problem is this is the smallest one I could find and I went with a two inch chassis and that thing, is, it's like, just doesn't quite fit. So I might have to play God with this thing a little bit. Um, you haven't seen it yet, but one of the things that I do with my chassis is that um, I like seeing the face. So when, I'll just have to show you a picture. But um, in either case, on the face of the amp, instead of covering all the fun stuff up, I like putting a, a clear acrylic uh thing with a, an LED light that goes over the top of it and then that shines through the acrylic and then you can see of course the naming and then you know that of course needs to be powered off of something and I usually use something similar to this um, I'm trying something a little bit different but uh, I was hoping I could get it to fit inside of here I still need to test that to make sure that one's gonna work that one's not the same as I usually use um, so we're trying to break ground on this guy but or trudge new ground on that guy. You'll notice here that I've left this guy and this guy intact. The reason being is I'm not sure yet if I need to get rid of them. Um, I am running this amplifier with a 5k primary impedance on the L -E -L -L -E -L 84 uh, What that means for you is that it just creates a little bit more headroom inside of the tube. It, it, it's less prone to breaking up, um, which should give it a more... Some people like it, some people don't. It's kind of a thing that uh, Matchless does. I may not like that, in which case, if I want to go to a 10K primary impedance, something similar or closer to what the original amp, you know, Valve Junior, if you will, has, I can still get rid of one of these and use the orange to get the, the, uh, the 10K primary impedance that I want. This here is the 115 volt tap for the input to the primary side of the power transformer. Uh, the reason I'm keeping that is I don't know exactly for sure what the voltages are looking like yet. Um, when I tested this thing while doing the, uh, the headphone trick, I did check to see that I had um, voltage at my uh, heaters and it was right at 6.4 volts. Uh, that is amazing. That means it is spot on. However, that could be an issue because now I've got to put two tubes in there and when you put two tubes in there, it might draw that voltage down a little bit further. Which is to say that if it does draw it down um, there and they are accurate with their prediction on the, the voltage, I may not have as much voltage as I want uh, on the uh, HT supply. Um, so if it ends up exactly 250 volts, um, that might be a little too low. So I can use the 115 volt tap, knowing that most of the places that this ample will exist will be seeing 120 volts from the wall. That'll give us an extra five, 
I mean, that's an extra 5 volts on the primary side. That could add up to 20 volts extra or more uh, inside of the amplifier. So this is one of those things you, you just want to keep your options open until you've tested the grounds. I haven't had a chance to do that yet with this build. So, um, you know, this, this is essentially the prototype of the prototype, which is kind of weird to say when you consider the fact that, you know, I've already prototyped this, but just I haven't prototyped it yet with actually all the parts that I'm using. So there we have it. Anyway, so uh, that's that. We're going to move on. So you're just going to see me doing more work. We're getting more work done. So just another kind of quick update on what's going on with this thing. Um, obviously I've connected a lot of the wires here. You'll notice that they're not exactly the correct length. They're a little longer than they need to be. Um, obviously this is just tacked in here to do some testing. I have tested it. Um, it does work. You'll see my crude uh, uh, artificial center tap there. Uh, we'll talk about that here in just a second, but this amp does work. It sounds great. It worked right off the bat. Um, I am now in the stage where I am going to be adjusting these two resistors right here to get the amount of voltage I want in the spots that I want. Right now, I do have an ideal amount of drop between the plate and the screen. So this 4.7K here is actually about spot on in terms of the voltage drop that I need. This one here, it's only dropping about a volt across it, maybe a couple volts. Um, this is a 10K, and I don't think it needs to be that big. Um, but uh, I'm not getting quite the voltage I would like to have on this side of the of the thing, but it's about right right there. I would like to get about 10 more volts there. So I might change that to an 8.2K or something like that and see if I can get a couple more volts there, but that's what we're in the stages of. Um, another way I could cheat this is I am using the 120 volt taps here. Um, I do have the 115 volt tap. Right now, when I tested this, let me rephrase that. When I tested this amp, I had about 118 volts coming in. And that was giving me the voltages that I was working with, you know, obviously. But if I went with a 115 volt tap, I could obviously get a couple more volts here, and then of course a couple more volts there. Eh, I don't really want to go that route just in case somebody does end up in a stout, you know, area of the country where they're pushing 125 or something. Then it might get us start getting a little hairy. It is biased a little cold. I have a 150 ohm resistor. Oops, sorry, finger in the shot. Um, I have a 150 ohm there tacked in temporarily. Um, that is, I'm sitting right about 80 to 85 percent of dissipation. So I'm very very close. I think 130 would be probably be ideal. So I have some 130 ohm uh, resistors on the way. Uh, aside from that, the only things that are really different in this amp right now is this artificial center tap that you see here. I try not to use them if I don't have to. Um, sometimes you can get away with that, sometimes you can't. Sorry, we're moving this camera quite, quite a bit here. Um, sometimes you can get away with it, sometimes you can't um, without it. I am going off, there's two different ways to do the center tap. I tacked it in this way just to very crudely get a center tap that comes off the cathode of the power tube. Uh, and the way that works is you literally go from each heater and then you combine these two together and you attach it directly to the cathode of the power tube. That uh, not only creates an artificial center tap, but it also raises the, the voltage, uh, the, the, like the ground potential up by 
several several tens of volts. Um, and in that case, it also it, it it brings the heater potential closer to the cathode potential, which reduces the noise even further. So it, it, it I guess you could say it brings the floor further down with it. Um, so it works great. Uh, without it, I was getting noise. When I had the other transformer, I didn't have any noise. So I don't. I don't know what was different between this transformer and the other one, but when I put this transformer in, I was granted with some, some awful noise. And I wasn't happy with it. I tried a couple different things to see if I could make it go away. It didn't change, so I went ahead and put the artificial center tap in, and I just need to actually finish that up. Um, I think this thing is just about ready to button up, and then we'll get on to the other fun stuff that's going on. So, I guess to kind of solidify a couple things here, um, A, you know, don't use a center tap unless you have to. Uh, obviously, if you have a center tapped heater supply, you would not need one of these. A uh, center tapped heater supply generally is quieter. Um, why this one doesn't have a center tapped heater supply, couldn't tell you. It's just not their thing, so artificial we had to go. Uh, as far as transformers go, uh, you know, as, as good as I am at reading the specs on these things, apparently I just didn't quite get that it did not exactly mean 250, 0, 250. It meant relative 250 to the center tap from peak to peak. So when you take the RMS voltage and you factor it out, so 125 on each half of the thing there, um, by the time you times it by 1.4, you end up with the actual running voltage that you'll see at this point here. And unfortunately, I didn't catch it. I was kind of on the fence about it. Again, I kind of I knew I could make that transformer work if I wanted to. Um, again, going with a bridge rectifier um, would have increased that voltage significantly, more so enough to, to run this amp quite healthily. Um, I was not looking to do it that way. I wanted to stay conservative. Um, and you know, so as a result, I ended up just going with a different transformer to do that. So there you have it. That's what we're at against now, or that's what we're at, where we're at right now. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so the next thing you're going to see is all this stuff buttoned up. Um, I also have not tacked in the pilot light yet, so that's going to get tacked in next. And then the other thing I have to do is I got to, oh, excuse me. So one of my things is I put LED lights um, inside of the cabinet, uh, not inside of the, there's no lights inside of the amp itself, but inside the cabinet, there are lights and you'll see in pictures later, but I use these led drivers. Well, these led drivers are obviously too big to fit in this amp right here. Well, maybe I could put it right there, but I don't really want this thing sitting right next to my, you know, my, uh, you know, the signal lines. It's too big to fit over here, so I have another one of these on order to try that should fit in this area over here, and uh, we'll go from there. But so this this needs to get wired into the either this point here or, or the pilot light. So I haven't really gone too deep with that yet because I already used these these little guys like that, and I don't want to double stack anything like that. We're really getting tight to the you know to the end of the chassis there, so kind of got to keep it you know keep it real anyway just a quick little run of what's going on here all right all right I'm sorry this part of the video is gonna be just a little bit loud um, I've got like 10 things going on I got the CNC machine kind of running in the background there I've got some laundry I got to do and yeah just everything's kind of going on right now but this is where we're at so um, I guess you could say we're kind of getting to the part where we're building the, the, the cabinet don't you dare laugh at my drawings I'm not an artist. <laughs> um, so you can kind of see what I'm going for here. I've gotten some dimensions kind of drawn up. Just obviously I'm going with three quarter inch uh, plywood for this, for this build. Uh, three quarter inch plywood is not three quarter inches. Uh, three quarters of an inch thick, excuse me. It is 23, 30 seconds or whatever the heck. Why they couldn't make it some nice round numbers beyond me, but that's where we're at. So if I want a 17 inch ID or OD, I need a 15 and 9 16 ID in order for that to work out. Um, never mind that there. I'm not going to put it. I was initially going to put some fascia on. Uh, I've gone against that. 
um, I'm doing with the top uh, you know a normal mounted thing here kind of think of like a matchless Avalon if you will uh, so the amp is gonna sit upright in the top in this little opening here um, so we'll have about uh, four inches of actual space left over in the top for this thing to breathe and then I'll have a plexiglass panel that kind of covers a portion of it it's not gonna seal it off um, I don't like back venting I like do I I like it so you can see the guts, and you'll see more of that here in a little bit. But what you have to do, obviously, to design a cabinet is come up with the dimensions that you want. These are the dimensions I had. Now, I'm fortunate. I have a CNC machine, so I just went up and I have Carvico here, so I got their subscription, and I just created all the different parts to the what you see here. So the baffle piece will, you know, this part here is what you're looking at there, and it's done up there. And then I actually have the CNC files to cut out the tops and the sides. I haven't done the stuff yet for the in, the internal kibbles and bits yet, other than the speaker baffle. But so next thing you're going to see is you know this machine over here cutting things out. So uh, sorry, excuse the mess. You know we still got work going on here. But yeah, this guy right there is going to get chopped out, and when we're done, it's going to look like that. Um, so sorry, um, but that's where we're at right now. So. It, Really, at this point in the game, you know, if you're building your own speaker cap, half the battle is coming up with a design that you want. Pick a size, it really doesn't matter when it comes to guitar. Um, I went for slightly oversized. Um, so I have a chassis that's 12 inches wide. So I need a 12 inch plus there, so I created a gap and, you know, it's, so it's obviously going to have a little bit wider on the sides than I need it to be, but I'm going to frame that in with something. And then of course the speaker, um, I'm going to center the speaker on the thing there, but um, I, I was trying to keep it, you know, as low as I could possibly get it in terms of height, but still be oversized in terms of the, you know, the, the, the speaker area. So, you know, this is 10 inches wide here, so the speaker will be sitting like right about there by the time we're done. So uh, you just kind of got to come up with some sort of an idea of what you want. Uh, you need to think ahead and how you're going to um, wrap this thing with Tolex. I'm doing Tolex on this particular one. So you need to think about how you're going to do that when you build your cabs. Especially if you're going to start getting crafty like I am here with this and doing you know, a top, you know, a top mounted uh, amplifier chassis inside of a thing like this. Most people hang them down off the back or they, you know, they put it and tuck it up you know, in the top on the front so all the kibbles and bits hang down. I don't like kibbles and bits hanging down obviously gravity is a you know gravity is a thing so I don't know if you can stick an amp so all the kibbles and bits go up well it just makes sense for them to be sticking up so I, I try to design things to make gravity work for me not against me right eh. um, so <clears throat> that is something uh, again that's a me thing it's not necessarily you know actuality or there's nothing empirical about it how's that um, so there you have it We'll move on now all right sorry it's still a little bit noisy obviously a lot going on still that's what we're cutting out uh, yeah so we're ready to go um, we're gonna hit enable here so we'll do that and then it's just a matter of hit go so we're gonna cycle the g-code to start so it goes there it's gonna go out to the middle So there it is. Really noisy as you can tell. This isn't something you do late at night. But there you have it. So I know a lot of you aren't fortunate enough to have CNC machines. I am, luckily. But uh, obviously there's more than one way to skin a cat. So for me this is just uh, the easiest way to do this. So enough of this crap. All right, and literally just a couple minutes later, I can't remember, uh, somewhere in here it tells you what the runtime was of that. Uh, it was something like two or three minutes. So as you can see, it's already cut out. It uh, just nicked the tape underneath, so that's great. Now what we're gonna do is cut the outside out. In hindsight, I probably should have done the outside first and then the inside so I can have the inside to actually hold things down. But I know that the outside is so little work that I'm not that worried about it. So we're gonna call up the other G-code. We can do that kind of by, uh, doing this so we'll go file ops sorry trying to do two things here at once we're gonna go first of all we're gonna get home zero there we go 
Then we're gonna go uh, close G code. Then we're gonna go load G code. Sorry, I know you guys probably can't see all this stuff. Um, and then what we wanna do is come down. Where are you at? Thank you. Um, oh, I'm gonna go with you. Yes. Please, there you go, that's what we're gonna cut. Sorry, I know you can't see much. All right, so there we go, we're gonna hit go. So, um, and boop. We'll fire up and off the races. If I did it right. Looks like I did. Mess. What a horrible noise. So obviously, that'll cut that out. I'll let it go all the way around once. Yeah, I got just a little bit of wasteboard. Not too much. I'm kind of limited. I can't get too far in over to here because of my vacuum setup, which really isn't doing much right now, but such is the game. But uh, that's going to run through, and uh, I'll check back with you in a minute. All right, yeah, you know you've got your machine set up good when uh, it just takes the, the tape off. Like, it just touched the surface there. It's been a while since I've actually even uh, dialed this machine in, but it's always nice when you can uh, set your thing up and... Sorry, I'm making a mess out of everything here, but when you can... Uh, Oh wow, that thing came out really good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, when you can uh, get all your stuff here and cut out an entire project and not leave any marks on your waste board. Um, here, I'll show you a little bit more here to take this stuff out. Wait, doing this stuff with one hand is really difficult, just saying. All right, so here's my centerpiece, nice. Anyway, look at that. Cut that whole thing out and I only nicked it right there. So. It's nice, it just cut through the tape on this part. That's how you know when you got your machine set up really nice. You can set it literally to right to the depth of your uh, of your media and just take a hair off right here. Um, I can't even, yeah, I don't know, I love this. This Having a CNC machine is great. If you can get one, definitely get one. Um, so over there you can see that's the waste area I had. Now the reason I did that is because that piece of wood was not square by any sense of the imagination um, so I wanted to give me some windage on each of the two sides and as I mentioned there's only so far I could go in with this part here before it would hit my base here so I, I flipped this thing upside down uh, normally this wouldn't be where it is uh, this this wasteboard I have it high, higher up now so I can do more work like this but um, when you go down to the base wood there I, I was able to get about another three quarters of an inch of usable depth out of this thing out of my z-axis so um, this is a 36 by 36 by 5 and I've turned it into a 36 by 36 by about 6 or something like that so whatever anyway uh, CNC machine is great I want to say it probably took me 20 minutes to build the, the files to do that and then um, I don't even have to measure and then cut anything I set the thing on there hit go and well, as you can see, you know what we got, so. Um, so, yeah, here's our speaker baffle. You can see it just missed it right there. That's how close it was, so. But yeah, I mean, that is why having a CM machine is so nice. It does just a little bit of a mess, but eh, whatever. Anyway. All right, and then, look, sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right, and then just after a few minutes of cleanup, everything's back to normal again. Yay! Uh, I measured this thing out. It is perfect. Um, so, again, just reiterating, I mean, obviously not everybody has a CNC machine to do this kind of stuff with, but um, if and you don't got one, you can obviously make something just as nice, probably just as quick, maybe even faster with, you know, table saws and stuff. I don't have a table saw. I opted for this to utilize, you know, a four foot by four foot, well, a little bit more than that now actually, but a four foot by four foot space in the middle of my garage. So um, for me, unfortunately, uh, I don't I don't have the luxury of having a full on wood shop where, where I'm at currently, but uh, 
we're working on that. Uh, when it came to me buying tools to work, you know, work with wood, I opted for this because I knew I can get a lot of it done. Sanding and stuff like that, you know, there's only one way to do it, but I can do thicknessing with this. I have a planer. Um, I have a router table if I need to do router table type stuff that you know maybe this thing can't do or something. But um, the point being is, you know, just do your math. Make sure you've got all your pieces worked out. The the beautiful thing about this is that I know. I got my tool drawer here. Um, I know that when I cut this thing out, it is going to be dead nuts square. So, you know, that is, that's why I like using this. I don't even have to, I have to, I don't have to worry about my miters. If I, if I know I need a 45, I can cut out 45s on, you know, flat pieces, obviously. If I need to do a, a chamfer, I can put a 45 degree bit in there and run a chamfer along the edge and get a 45 degree chamfer or something like that. But, you know, having something like this, you know, a, a CNC machine like this, like I, I've never had any cut ever on a table saw come out as square as this. And I know it's going to come out exactly to the dimension. So this thing's is going to be 13 inches tall by seven, uh, well, in this case, 15 and nine sixteenths wide, which it is. So, um, not really trying to brag or anything like that. Really just trying to drive home. Like, uh, I'm not a great craftsman, <laughs> at least not with wood. So, you know, I, I, I cheated and got a tool that did the work for me. So I'm good with the software side of things and I'm good with, you know, the fine tuning, like the little nitpicky sort of things. But when it comes to just making a table saw or, you know, even a, you know, a radial arm saw or a hand saw really get a finite cut for me that is as true as this can't be done. Not by my hands anyway. So that's where this tool comes in. So anyway uh use what you got it you know obviously this thing's gonna be covered by tolex you're never gonna see it so it doesn't really matter how perfect it is or not so um we'll keep chugging along though all right here we go so what we're gonna run is the sides here so we're gonna have two long pieces and uh all i gotta do now is hit go so i'm gonna hit go and if all goes well it should just do what it needs to do It's gonna be hell, so we're gonna just stop here. We'll come back in a few minutes. All right, and just like that, it is done. So let's go ahead and we'll bring this up to work zero here. So see what that is. Just, yeah, get it in the shot. Sorry. So that brings that up. Goes to work zero. Okay. I love it. You can just see there, it's catching the tape on the back side. Oh, and you get it just right, it's so nice. Alright, anyway, moving on. We'll, uh, we'll see you in the next one. And just like that, we've got a top and a bottom made. One thing I can say is if you, obviously you saw me run it earlier with just, without the, uh, without the, you know, the dust boot on there. Uh, it is a metric crap ton cleaner when you actually use the dust boot. Um, as you can see here, my workspace is actually quite clean. So, needless to say, we are done with the major parts now. There's only a couple more pieces left that I need to deal with, but uh, we'll come back to those later. So, there we go. Alright, so here we go. We've got this thing all kind of jammed together. So, as you can see, what I've done here is I put those things in uh, left, right. D is just A, B, C, D. So, that's what those are. So you can see I got some more down there. So I opted to do the pins all the way through. Um, I find this to be just a little more accurate when you're trying to get like something that's, you know, absolutely freaking dead nuts. Um, it's nice to be able to think you can do this blind. Sorry, get it in the shot. It's nice to think that you can get it blind and do this. Uh, the challenge I have found over the years is that um, when you're trying to do that, you're literally, you know, getting into, uh, if I can get it in the shot, Getting it into here, no problem. It's getting this side to line up. Like, how do you do that? And the easiest way is to just go all the way through uh, because you can clamp these corners together. Um, and then when you're done, you just literally end up with something that just is square as can be. Um, obviously, I still got to glue this together. Um, so it still weeble wobbles. But um, I mean, I don't think you can ask for much better than that on its own. You know, it's, it's good to go. So there's that i got some more wood over there for other projects and stuff like that the tolex is sitting back there uh you can just see the amp in the background there uh we still got some work to do on that yet still but we're ready to glue this up 
All right, just a quick little update. I know you probably are wondering, okay, how are you designing all these parts? So what you're looking at here is my uh, back plates that I'm gonna put on the back of the combo amp. I use a software called uh, Carvico um, to create a lot of this stuff. It's great for stuff like this, you know, small, simple little things that you just need to throw out on the CNC machine or whatever. Um, so if you have a CNC machine and you don't have you know, a simple, a simple thing like Carvico. Carvico is a great uh, software to get into, but that's what I'm, <clears throat> sorry, that's what I use to create these quick parts um, here, just down and dirty, but that's about it for that, so, all right. All right, and as you can see here, we got the next piece that's about to pop out. So this is gonna be the back support. Um, basically, this is what all the back panels will go on to. This little cutout here is because at the top of the amp I need the, the cable from the speaker to come up and into the back side of the amplifier so I made that little cutout there. But you can kind of see this is done with Carvico so uh, you can really quickly, I mean I probably made this in about five, five to ten minutes maybe, something like that. Um, you just create a box and then you do an offset on the box to make it smaller, do some fillets on the corner there and then you may create another box to um, of course, I'm really in the wrong software to kind of do it, but to give you an idea of how you can do it in Carvico, though, you know, you create a box, you offset the inside of the box, you know, so you move it in however far you want to go, you fill it the corners, and then you create another box up there, that, you know, X amount of width, and then you chop out the section, and then you use a fillet on the, the you know, where you want to, you know, soften the edges up, and there you go. So, there we are. So, this is what we're going to cut out now. All right, and finally we have the back plates or the back boards. Um, this is just for the bottom half of the combo amp. I still haven't designed the um, top part to cover the back part of the chassis yet, but um, this is the last piece I'm gonna get to probably for today. Um, I need to actually do some more installation type stuff before I get to the back, the actual back cover. Um, the unfortunate thing is I have not actually built this amp yet, so this is all literally being, uh, well, I'm making it pretty much as we're going along here, so I'm kind of semi-documenting everything. I'm not going step by step, but um, just kind of trying to give you an idea of all the different pieces and give you an idea of what they look like and what you can do to get there with them. But anyway, that's what we got for this part. So this is about what you can get done in a day of design and um, design and cutting. Uh, so I started probably eh, early afternoon, maybe 11 noonish, right in there. And it is currently six o'clock, and I've already done some cleanup work and some other vide videography shit. So uh, in either case, you know, in, in about a day's time, you can come up with all these parts if you got a CNC machine. And so that's what's great about doing that. No, no jigsaw crap. Um, I'm lucky in that regard. Again, I keep emphasizing that, but that's not the point. Anyway, so I made a, des a little design flaw, I think. Um, I didn't think about it so much about how this piece here was going to work with this guy here. So when it goes up against to the back of the amplifier, you can kind of see here that there's a little, a little triangles. I don't know if you can kind of see that or not, but here, let's get that up in there. So you can see the little triangles there are sticking out. Um, so I'll have to probably either trim these back or something like that. Uh, this piece here really isn't much more than anything other than to support the chassis plate and to you know have something to mount these to. So eh, if I have to cut these back a little bit, that shouldn't be too big of a deal. But I'd rather not if I don't have to. But in either case. Uh, the, the purpose for this little cutout right here is to get the amp over here now. Is to provide access to this little space here. Obviously, uh, you know, we need to be able to get the cable up and in, and it just gives you a little bit of room if you need to make an adjustment. So, I needed to have 
you know some sort of space in order to get the cable through. Uh, I'll be using a 90 degree, so the the hope and the the prayer is that this thing will sit right about here. And uh, if I did everything right, <laughs> if I did everything right, which it, right now it's uh, not looking so hot, but we'll see. I don't know. Uh, I may have to redo this this plate here. We'll see. Um, but. Uh, that's kind of the downside. Like I say, um, I haven't made this amp before. I'm literally making it up as I go along. So trying to see what it is you're doing while you're doing it is kind of hard. But what I'm going to do is move the camera over and I'll kind of get, uh, I'll get everything propped up so you can actually see what this kind of looks like. So you can see a little bit more what I'm talking about here. So this, you can imagine, will be up here. So I got just those little corners sticking out there. So I'll have to, I'll have to chop these back. I'll have to chop these back. My apologies. Um, obviously, I'm using another challenge that I made for myself is I'm using three quarter inch uh, back plates. Most people use half inch or quarter inch board. Um, there's no reason for me not to. I just, you know, I had all this available and. I kind of like it because it's a little more rigid, you know, I want something that's going to last an eternity. Um, this is definitely going to last an eternity, but uh, I, I don't know if it's going to cause problems getting this area done here with the Tolex. We're going to find out. So that'll be something that we kind of cross when we get there. Um, if I have to go with a quarter inch panel, what I'm going to have to do is redesign this piece here and cut it, you know, cut it so it comes out past here. So that way, when I pull this thing back a little bit, this direction, it won't, you know, won't be, you know, coming out of the thing there. And then I can use quarter-inch panels or something like that for this section here. Sorry, I'm probably making you all sick and dizzy, but um, I'm not necessarily trying to go for huge internal volume. Um, uh, it's a semi, semi-closed back, if you will. So obviously, this guy will be down here, and then the objectively. This guy will be there, so we'll have just, you know, that little bit of space there. So it really doesn't matter what size the cabinet is so much. It's already a little oversized. Um, so I didn't want to make it too big because I didn't want it to get heavy, and I didn't want to make it too small so it doesn't, you know. So like In this case here, I think we're going to be all right. Um, obviously, there's going to be some supports that go vertically like that that will block off this side of here. The chassis will sit in the middle there. But yeah, it's the only other purpose of this thing here is to just suppress, yeah, provide support. But man, oh man, that thing's nice. It's gonna be amazing, uh, I hope, when I'm done. So um, I may need to redesign this part here. Um, based on my math, it should have been fine. But after having done all this stuff here, um, it's, it's, sorry, I'll actually get you in camera view here after cutting this out here and kind of getting it, things lined up um, it's looking like I only have about a half inch lip on the front which is about right well we're gonna find out I don't know um, it's one of those things again where I when you're designing one thing and you're not thinking about the other um, and you, you you mess up but luckily this part is easy to fix I've got enough spare material to deal with that so um, yeah, there you go. You can kind of just see how it works. So anyway, take care. We'll see you in a bit. probably don't have to explain too greatly what it is I've done up to this point um, as you can see I've gotten it all put together and that I've gone and uh, put a uh, an edge on this thing I guess if you will I rolled over the edge I don't know what they call it I uh, 
you know, I made the edges look round. <laughs> so I got a couple spots I got to patch up here. It's unfortunate this is on the front, but by the time I'm done, you shouldn't see it. Obviously, I got the front supports in here. This is where the chassis will sit. And then I've got everything kind of glued together. They're also screwed together here. Let's turn that around so you can see. I shaved all those down. I got some filling to do right there. And then I uh, I put a bunch of holes on the side. So this this baffle here has got screws in it. So there's quite a few screws in this thing. You can actually just see where they were there. But uh, so yeah, this thing is this thing is held in place really well. It's not going anywhere. What's really kind of cool about it is that the top is also screwed down. There's screws in there, and then these supports here are not only glued in but also screwed into this part, which is drilled and drilled and screwed into down here. So this top is not going anywhere. And of course, the bottom is screwed and glued to both the you know. So I'm not worried about the bottom going anywhere. Um, I didn't put any screws here. I put I used wood dowels on the side, and then you know I went with a regular butt joint. And everybody's like, oh, most people would think, oh, that's scary because you know that's the weakest of all joints. They've done some tests on it. It's not really all that weak. It's you know obviously you have to have a good bond, have to get everything glued really well. But uh, with the dowels in there, I'm definitely not too worried about it shearing off. And then of course with this thing in there you know, having it kind of glued in and also screwed in. Like this whole shelf right here, if you will, is all literally one piece. And it's all connected to the sides in multiple spots. So I have very little worry about this guy or the bottom coming apart, um, ever. <laughs> I think this thing is held by, held together by 50 some odd screws or more. So that's where we're at right now. So we'll keep on keeping on. All right, another quick update here. We are getting ready to put the grill cloth on. I went with the, uh, it's the aftermarket uh, version of the um, Blues Breaker grill cloth for this thing. Um, it is very, very stiff when you first get it. But the trick when you're putting on a uh, grill cloth, I'm not gonna do a step-by-step -step on this. There's a hundred videos out there showing it. But when you get grill cloth that is as stiff as this stuff is, the trick is to get it saturated, like wet, like wet, wet. Like I, I don't have another piece to show you, but from, from what it was to now, uh, after getting it wet, it's 10 times more, uh, more pliable. So before I had folded this over to make sure it would fit and it was actually holding the shape that I had it before. And after getting it wet and by getting it wet, I mean literally just taking like a damp cloth or a spray gun or something like that. And just making it, you can kind of see the splotches there. So on the back side, I got it wet. And you can kind of see it's fairly even in color. But on the front, you can really see where it's, you know, wetter in some spots than in others. So you just want to get it wet. And you can kind of tug it and stretch it a little bit. And then what that will allow you to do is to get it stretched over the, hold on, let's put it on there. So we've got this guy here, right? So when we put it on there and we fold it over and you tack it down and then you stretch it this way, right? It'll, it'll pull a little bit. And then what you do is you go back with the heat gun and we'll show that process a little bit later. But once we get this tacked up, you'll see, I won't be able to get it tight enough to have it taut here, but we will use a heat gun or, you know, like a hair dryer or something like that. And then we'll be able to, uh, to get this thing almost as tight as a drum. All right, I'm going to kind of do this a little bit here, kind of show you what I got going on. Um, sorry, it's going to be at an odd angle. So you just kind of get this thing lined up. What you want to do is get the whatever side is going to be vertical, vertical. You want to get that kind of done and out of the way. Um, and then you kind of want to also make sure that you got enough on either side in this direction. So right there, it's pretty dang close, very close. So we're good. We're well centered at this point, so you just want to line this up along, and I can't really show you here, but you just kind of got to get it lined up. And then the trick is to kind of start from the center, so get it lined up really good, and then you, you start in the middle. You kind of get it tucked over the corner there, and you're just really trying to make it nice and square. So you kind of just do that, and then you get your stapler, 45 degree angles, okay? And clack, thing is on there, it's not moving now. 
that thing is in there. So now that we've got that, we can kind of see how you can kind of push it and it, it causes this to pull tight there. You don't have to get super tight on this first side here. We're really just looking to get this thing nice and square is all we're really trying to do here. So we want this first side to be as square as we can get it. So you want to make sure that when you do this, that you don't end up with a bunch of waves on the starting side, okay? You want to make that as nice as you can get it. So we're just going to make sure that we kind of got this thing nice and square. And we'll just do, do them every couple, you know, every few, uh, like maybe every inch or something like that, every something like that right in there. There we go, that's looking pretty good. You want to make sure you avoid any kind of holes that you got. You don't want to put a staple over one of your holes. That would be ungood. And you just kind of work from the center out. So I'm going to kind of go this direction for now. And we're going to have, looks like we're going to have some, uh, some bunching up here. But we're going to deal with that in a minute. What we're going to do is get this edge right here. You can kind of just see there's this line. That's what I'm going to use as my kind of starting point. But... I'm fighting with this stuff a little bit because it is pretty stiff, this uh, material. Yeah, it's a little, little wide on that one, but... Okay. And as you get going along here, it gets a little bit easier as you get more and more towards the edge. Uh, I will say that. Or as you get more and more of them in, it kind of gets easier. So now that we've got that, that's looking pretty good. I got a thing right there, so I got to be careful. I'm not probably going to have to put this more towards the outside when I get down there. But that's looking pretty, pretty schnazzy right there. So I'll get that right there. Then I'm going to move up now. Sorry if I'm bopping the camera around. Just trying to, trying to do this quickly, while at the same time also keep keep things moving here. So that looks pretty good the rest of the way up, so. Yeah, right there. An electric stapler is very nice, or an air stapler or something like that. I'm using an electric one. This is just a Harbor Freight Special. You don't need a freaking super tool to do this. It's uh, not rocket surgery. And we're going to get one more right there. All right, so. Now what we've got is when we come around to the other side here, you can see we've got it nice and straight along this edge there. So now when we pull this tight, you do want to go tight. You don't necessarily need to try to crank it too much. We're going to go over with the heat gun. The heat gun is going to solve most of those issues for us. So what you want to do is get one side done first. And you can see how this material is stretching a little bit with me. So that is a good thing. I might need to put one in these corners here, but I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So what you're trying to do also is make sure that you've got things nice and square on this other side. So now I feel like I'm pretty squared up on this other side here. So that's when you wrap this thing around on the other side. Again, just trying to make sure you got it nice and done up there again avoid your holes I got a hole right there so I got to be careful and so I'm gonna say that is pretty snazzy so we'll get one right there put another one right there so this thing's held on there now and you can see it's not very tight I don't know if you can tell but you can see it's not very tight um, it's very hard. I don't know. I need a bigger, better camera system than what I got, but baby steps. We're getting there a little by little. All right. You'll see that some of this stuff's going to fall out perfectly normal. It's okay. Nothing to be scared of. So then you just kind of keep doing the same thing. You're going to follow it down the line. You're just going to, again, you want to make sure that this line that you create with your material is nice and straight. So, so what's going to happen is when this stuff shrinks, it's going to 
it's going to kind of go with that that flow that you've created so if you got a wavy line here it's going to kind of create a wavy line elsewhere so you want to make sure that you get it square you want it nice and pretty like because it'll pull to the tightness that you've created if you will so there you go hopefully hopefully we got all this in because this is done now this is going so my next hole is up here didn't really put that staple in a nice spot but whatever I'd say that this this run that I've got going right here is looking pretty good so I'm gonna run with that I'm just gonna kind of get going on down the line here I'm gonna get one more right here. Okay. I'm gonna flip this over. I'm gonna go down the other side here. Get this other half going. And you can kind of just see how it'll how you can twist this thing around. Again, you don't have to go super crazy with the staples. Uh, I'm probably going a little bit more than I need to. I'm gonna go with another one, I'm happy with it. Alright, that's looking pretty good the rest of the way there, so we're going to go ahead and button this up. Okay, so there's that. So now when we put this thing in there, you can just kind of see that we're right on the corner of both of these things here. So when we do this, when we tighten it up, it's going to tighten up, obviously. So. Now, what we need to do is start cutting these corners in and creating a nice sharp line there. I'm not gonna go crazy on that. I think you can kind of get the idea. This is really just showing you what you need to do. Um, obviously, cutting corners, you just cut the corner and then we're gonna fold it over this way and then we're gonna cut this thing at a 45. Again, we're gonna notch it around these uh, the holes that I got there in the corner. So you just wanna make it so that it goes nice and tight. We'll probably put a couple staples in the corner when we're done make sure it's nice and tight there but that's really it's not that tight you'll see but when we'll come back later and we'll show you what happens when you uh, when you uh, put the heat gun on it all right all right and just like that we have this thing all done up it came out really straight you can see that there's maybe you can't I don't know I'll try to make it so you can I'll get it at an angle uh, you know I got it on there pretty tight you can see some deflection there. So this is not my best job. Please do not judge me by this. Um, I am not an upholsterer and I've only done a few of these over the years. So, uh, you know, buying things pre-made is kind of helpful in that regard, but I just went around and yada, yada, yada. I'll probably put a couple more staples here and there, but uh, the corners are the most difficult part. Uh, they like to fray a little bit and this material is let me tell you, this material is meant to have piping. Um, I think the uh, piping is really what makes this material work. Uh, this corner here is going to be probably the most difficult part. The beauty of it is, is once this thing goes in in the uh, the cabinet, you know, you probably should never have to remove it ever again. Um, you can kind of tell I never really made it. To, I never, I over-engineered things quite a bit. But uh, in either case, let's uh, bust out some heat see what this thing does now I'm gonna use a heat gun I advise against using a heat gun um, you probably should use a hair dryer it's got a lower heat this one has two heat settings I'm gonna go with a low one um, I'm just gonna go at a distance you're gonna hear it but what you do is you just heat it up a little bit you want to move over the whole surface of the thing and you're really not trying to get it too super duper hot you're just trying to make it uh, get warm enough to start shrinking and you can, you'll actually start to see and feel it shrink as you touch it um, and actually as I was working with it um, that is the high heat setting by the way uh, as I was working with it and it got drier and drier I could feel it stretching more and more as I worked with it more and more and more but yeah I'm using my hand as kind of a gauge to feel how hot it is and then you just kind of work the whole thing little by little. You're not trying to get it all at once. Um, some people will stick them in front of like a space heater or something like that. Um, the space heater is nice because it'll heat the whole thing kind of 
evenly. So you just set this thing out a couple feet in front and just let it warm up for an hour or two. And this stuff will just shrink up like a, uh, uh, like a, like a drum head almost. Uh, I really didn't show you this part, this thing that's in here. I didn't really show you that. This piece here, I actually milled out the inside. So there's actually a quarter inch step on the inside of this thing. Um, well, it's still a little moist, so we got some time to go here. So I obviously I painted the back, the front side of it black, and then there's like a, a quarter inch, not quarter inch, excuse me, a, a sixteenth of an inch step between the edge all the way around. It's about a quarter inch lip all the way around, and then uh, you know it's recessed a little bit, and that's where all the little uh, T nuts go in from the back. Um, the object behind that was that way if this thing does start to vibrate a little bit. It won't, uh, won't rattle too much against anything. Um, I went with a fairly thin piece of uh, material for the uh, for the uh, the baffle or the grill frame, if you will. That's why I only cut out a circle here for the speaker to kind of go through. And you'll see it actually kind of tops up, cuts off just the tip top of the circle. But actually, this thing is as big around as the entirety of the speaker. And this thing goes flush against the actual port that the speaker goes onto. So um, this part right here is probably maybe sticking into the speaker by, I don't know, maybe a quarter of an inch on either side that you can actually see or whatnot. But yeah, it's not quite there yet. I can still feel it's a little wet around the edges. Um, so yeah, you just kind of heat it up and you'll kind of see it just gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And it's starting to a little bit got tighter around the edges. It doesn't have to be crazy tight. Um, actually, if you get them too tight, they'll actually ring, believe it or not. Uh, there's some things on some of the other websites that I've heard about where um, they get so tight that they'll actually start to ring like a drum. But in any case, this is all we got here. There's not much to it. You just heat it up nice and evenly over the whole surface until it comes tight. All right, take care. All right, there it is all done up. Um, it didn't get as tight as a drum, but it got much tighter. Um, I think it will, uh, I think it will uh, shrink a little bit more once it cools down. Uh, this stuff's a little bit different than some of the other ones, like the, the full on nylon mesh stuff, like what uh, Fender uses is where it's actually just nylon mesh, that stuff, contracts pretty good like if you get it as tight as I had this one it would just right is you know nearly as tight as a drum whereas this stuff here it's more like a it's like a weird nylon with like a paper it's actually like a paper um see sorry it's like a paper type material this isn't like the original stuff where it was like this rubberized like the original blues breaker stuff was like this rubberized cotton type concoction that made up each of these lines. I'm actually using this thing inside out and vertical. I think the original direction it's supposed to go was like this. And you can kind of see why, because in this orientation you can see more of the, of like the, I can't remember what they call that terminology, but you can see the intricacy of the wound paper. So this paper, material is like woven into the stuff and it's got like this since it's you know balled up weird you can see the texture from it I can't there's a terminology for it i'm going vertical with mine um i just i liked it because it seemed like it would produce straighter lines for me and i liked it because when you were looking at it straight up and down from this angle here it just looked a little bit cleaner um, but when you were looking at it straight on, you could still kind of see that, that weird, you know, how these things are wound up. You could see the weirdness of it a little bit more, I felt anyway, but so there it is. Um, obviously you, if you were to get this stuff, uh, you can go either direction in mine. I've got a pretty tall box as you've seen. So, you know, this, I felt going vertical would help make it seem just a little bit bigger than it actually was, but we'll see. Um, I got enough. I could do it the other way if I needed to. Anyway, that's it for this one and we'll keep on moving on.